Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Friday, May 29th, we are studying Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. The Christian life is characterized by love. There is no need for Christians to seek vengeance because that belongs to God. Christ is Lord, after all. But what does that mean in relationship to the governing authorities? St. Paul turns to that topic in today's text. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Matt Ulmer. Pastor Ulmer serves at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Bishop, Texas. Pastor Ulmer, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Good morning. Pastor Ulmer, as we get started, give us some context here in the letter to the Romans. Paul turned a pretty big corner at the beginning of chapter 12, where he appealed to the Roman Christians according to the mercies of God and began to lay out for them what life in response to the gift of Jesus Christ looks like. So what do we need to know as we go into Romans 13 today? Yeah, I I think it's always good and fitting to kind of remember what what's going on in the book of Romans, St. Paul's kind of great treatise where he starts out talking. He he gives his great treatise on, of course, sin and grace uh, for the first eight, nine chapters. He then kind of goes on his treatise talking about the people of Israel, they're falling away, the engrafting of the Gentiles into Israel. And then, like you said, in, in Romans 12 is kind of where the discussion for today is kind of relevant because Paul, he, he switches gears and starts talking about how it, how one should live a Christian life. Once somebody has become a believer in Jesus, how ought they live? Um, Romans 12, the first couple verses, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So that kind of command from Paul carries over into chapter 13 at the beginning, and one of these places where the Christian life is transformed by becoming one of Christ is in how the Christian relates to government. Yeah, we, we never want to lose sight of Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, particularly the way that Paul founds it. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, in view of what God has done, this yep. is what life now looks like. And that, that helps us in a couple of respects. One, it, it helps us to recall that this Christian life isn't the foundation of our status before God. Our status before God is founded upon His mercies and His mercies alone. It's not based on our works. It's based on Christ's works on our behalf and that righteousness of God that we receive by faith. That verse, verse 12, or sorry, 12 verse 1, keeps that central for us, that all of what Paul's going to talk about, the Christian life afterwards, is based upon those mercies of God. And that that's an important thing to keep in mind. I also think it's an important thing to keep in mind as we think about God's mercies, because the subject matter in chapter 13, verses 1 through 7 particularly, it doesn't always seem very merciful, if I can put it that way. It, it's a bit of a, a change, it seems, in subject. Well, it, it's not a change in subject matter, but maybe the move from the end of chapter 12 to the beginning of chapter 13 can seem a bit stark. So, And we don't want to do that. We want to keep this in context, which sometimes Romans 13 is one of those chapters that just gets ripped out of its context— and, and people will, particularly with 
you know, the times that we're in when it comes to matters of government, people will just say, well, you know what Romans 13 says. Well, yep. what, what does it say? That's an opportunity for us today. So, but help us put it into context, Pastor Ulmer, in, in where Paul was in chapter 12, the end of it, the subject matter there, what's the move that he's making from the end of 12 into 13? How do those two progress into one, from one to the next? Yeah, I, I think what, what, you, what you stated before was quite interesting uh, by mentioning how a lot of the times we don't see the relationship between the Christian and the government being one of mercy. And in, in, one, in one way of thinking, I can, I can see that because from the government side, and we can talk about this a little bit more later, you always have the, the fear of punishment. So putting punishment and mercy together kind of seems like a uh, bridge that can't be crossed, uh, a bridge that we don't want to cross. As, as Christians, but properly understood, I, I, I think that the, the move that, that you're trying to make is the Christian understands um, the government in a different way after becoming a child of God. You rightly stated that our, our relationship with God and all of the things surrounding that is based on what Christ has done for us. Because he shed his blood, because he was raised from the dead, because he promises to come back, we are called children of God, and, and nothing that happens in this world can change that. But, and, and this is kind of a huge caveat, once we become children of God, everything changes uh, in our life. We, we know God's will expressly laid out for us, and as God's children, we ought to want to keep his will. And, and one of those areas where God has told us what his will is, is in our relationship with the government. So as Paul is ending Romans chapter 12, talking about kind of the, the, the marks that make a Christian what they are, the kind of the... Um, the characteristics uh, of what a Christian uh, does, one of them is how they relate to the government, and that's kind of where we're starting today. Right. Uh, so a couple of things. First, I think the way that you framed the question is you said it better than I did. But the, the question that I think we want to explore is how does the role of the government as an avenger, as one who punishes wrongdoing, how does that fit into the mercies of God that Paul is founding this whole section upon. And, and two, I, I think you said also very well that the life of the Christian in response to the mercies of God, that's what Paul is talking about. And even there in Romans chapter 12, a couple days ago, we were talking about what is translated as your spiritual worship really should be understood as this is your, your sensible response to what God has done. So the things that Paul lays out in chapters 12, 13, and following, this is the sensible thing to do because of what God has done. And part of that is the Christian's relationship to government, which is perhaps a bit surprising, particularly for Paul in his context. The government in his day is Rome. Yep. Nero is the emperor. He's just at the very beginning of his reign in all likelihood. The letter to the Romans was written in the mid-50s AD, probably, and Nero came to power in the mid-50s. And when we hear the name Nero, we tend to think of his later reign when he went a little bit crazy, honestly, and he, he started persecuting Christians very horribly. Earlier yep. in his reign, it wasn't quite that bad. But nonetheless, it, it's not as if Rome was particularly friendly to Christians either. And that's who Paul has in mind. And I think that's, that's not something we should lose sight of as we read these words, as Paul was writing them to Rome, and then think about how we're going to use them today. I, I, I agree with you. Um, I think at this time you can probably at best characterize the, the Roman government to the Christian church as ambivalent. That's kind of the, the best case scenario. Um, but they, they definitely did become more antagonistic. And, and yet, I think Paul's words to the Roman Christians about obeying uh, the governing authorities stands 
and then by extension, um, they they extend to us too as Christians because I, I think that the command with respect to God's law and revealed will is a lot more general than merely St. Paul telling the Roman Christians to obey a government that would become kind of tyrannical. I think it's more broad than that. Let's go ahead and see what Paul says then. This is Romans chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Paul writes, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. That is our text for today, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Pastor Ullman, there's there's a lot of terms here that we want to understand properly, and so we're going to do our best, I think, to sort them out one by one, and yet they're all going to relate to each other as well, so there's going to be overlap. The first, the first word is in verse 1, where Paul says, let every person be subject to the governing authority. So let's talk about what it means to be subject or to submit to the governing authorities. Yeah, I think in in this text, I don't I don't know what your opinion is, but in this particular text, I think the most fascinating word that exists in this text is that uh, verb to submit oneself or to subordinate oneself. I think understanding what this is is absolutely key uh, to figuring out what Paul is saying to the Christian church. And the, the Greek word there, and this comes up multiple times in this passage and mo- also multiple times in Paul's other letters, is the verb hupotasso. And kind of your verb tasso is to, to be ordered. And when you put the prefix hupo under, it means to order oneself under, underneath. Um, so when, when we're talking about Paul telling the Christian church to subordinate themselves, uh, we're saying that the, the command is coming for the Christian because of who they have been made in Christ Jesus to put themselves underneath authority. So order underneath, that's the, the basic way of understanding submission or mm-hmm. subjection, which are, are pretty harsh terms in English, or at least they've taken on that connotation recently. Why, why is it important to understand this is an ordering underneath of this authority? Yeah, I, I, think, I think where the negative connotation comes from is a lot of the times when we hear about subjection, we're, we're talking about somebody, subject, somebody subjecting other people, somebody coming in, a power coming in, and taking somebody and putting them underneath of them, so kind of conquering them or, or bringing them down, forcing them into subjection. How, how I kind of read this passage is, is, is not that. Paul's not saying, hey, Roman government, come in and take these Christians and, and put your foot down on them so that they are underneath you in power. Rather, Paul here is telling the Christians to, to take themselves in kind of their identity as children of God, and place themselves uh, kind of voluntarily under the uh, governing rulers because that's what God wants them to do. So in in this text, I, I believe that 
Paul is asking Christians kind of in their Christian freedom to to do this voluntarily, not to be subjected by force. Well, I think that's a, a good a good thing to remember is that Paul is writing to the Christian here. Now he does say let every person be subject to governing authorities, which I, I think, especially with the idea of order as it shows up in this passage, that every person being subject to governing authorities should apply beyond Christians. It should apply to literally every person. But he is speaking specifically to Christians, and I think that's a, a wise recognition that Paul's not telling the government in this passage, go subject people to yourself. He's telling the people who are under authority to place themselves under that authority, to to be willing in this submission, subjection, to be a willing participant in this order that exists. Yep. And I think I think that's an important word, that this is an order that is set, because I, I think the word order implies someone who has ordered, and that I think is going to come up as the passage continues. But if I'm I'm a part of an order, it's not there's no there's not a meaninglessness to it. And it it gives a a reason to it, not just a well I, I think that the submission one of the, the troubles that people today particularly have with it is they would ask a question, something like this. Well, does Paul want blind obedience or unconditional support? Is that the sort of submission that he's talking about? How would you respond to that, Pastor Ulmer? I, I would respond by, by saying, no, this, this isn't blind obedience to the governing authorities because the the subordination does come with a purpose and and that purpose is coming up later on in this passage i mean under understanding subordination in in the order is understanding that that god has placed in order creation from the beginning to operate in a certain way and when that order is maintained things go well for human beings with with government, they have a purpose, and and when they are doing their purpose, a, a Christian should have no kind of to fear of the government kind of o- overstepping their authority, which I'm sure we're going to talk about in a second, because that's probably the second most important word in this entire uh, passage. Um, so as as I would say to the Christian, as long as the government is. Uh, doing their task in God's creation, it ought be followed. Where's the line? I, I think it's pretty clear from, from Paul and other Christian thinkers that the line is when the government demands that the Christians sin. Um, so as long as that line's not been crossed, as long as they are exercising a right authority, uh, it is good for human beings, and especially Christians, to, to order themselves under the government. Hmm. I, and I, I understand what you're saying. There's the classic passage, I think, is in Acts chapter 5, where Peter and the apostles say we must obey God rather than men. And certainly that in, when it comes to the matter of obedience, that's true. We must obey God rather than men. That's always true. Even as this passage, verse 1, about being under the order of the authorities that exist is is true. And and I think where things get difficult, if I can put it that way, is, is precisely where you say where the governing authority is beginning to order something that really is out of order. It's out of yep. God's order. And they begin to make laws, commands that go outside of that order. I, I wonder, and so this is where I, I want to put this in the, the most immediate context again. The very preceding verse, 1221, Paul said this, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that vocabulary continues into this passage of good and evil as true purposes for governing authorities. That, and I know, I know maybe we're getting ahead of our, or I'm getting ahead of you, Pastor Palmer here. But I, I think this is important when it comes to this matter of what does it mean to be under the order of governing authorities? Well, that always yeah. falls in line of being under the order that, as you said, 
God has placed. And so verse 21 of chapter 12 always applies when it comes to this submission, this being under the order, that as we see the government do evil, because it does happen, and we don't have to think very far to come up with lots of examples, when we see the government do evil, what is the Christian response? It's always to overcome yeah. evil with good. And I, I, mean, I think that verse has to guide our discussion into chapter 13. I, I, I agree, and I, I think in, in this discussion that you brought up there, I think there, there's a couple <clears throat> distinctions that need to be made and, and maybe a, a couple different paths of discussion in order to kind of unwind it. Because I, I think the, the kind of the beauty and brilliance of, of Paul's treatment of the Christian's response to government in Romans 13 is in its kind of brevity and its kind of simplicity, because I, I think that St. Paul gives us the, the key to how to deal with uh, an evil government in Romans 13, 1 through 7, because those governments that have been ordered for our good are also under authority themselves, and therefore they are uh, – the governments are therefore accountable to somebody at some point. And I think ultimately when you go up the chain, the, the Christian's hope is that when evil is done by the governing authorities, there there is somebody who is going to judge, and that judgment is going to come from God. And if that judgment doesn't come on this side of eternity, that uh, judgment is going to come at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ on the last day. That, that's a, a very important thing to keep in mind. And that that's where understanding submission or being subject to being under an order is so important so that we would recognize who is the one that sets the order, who's at the top of this order, and that is God. The word later in verse, uh, it's in verse 4, where the governing authority is called an avenger. That word is used yeah. of God elsewhere. It's in, I believe it's in 1 Thessalonians 4, that God is called an, an avenger. And so this is an important, not, not avenger like the movie, <laughs> but, yeah, but an avenger exactly. as, as described here, even, even as Paul described him earlier in chapter 12, that vengeance belongs to the Lord. And he stands Correct. at the top of this order. And that, that really, I mean, again, I think this helps us set this whole conversation in terms of what we were saying at the beginning, this is a part of what does it mean to respond to the mercies of God? And mm -hmm. as surprising as it might seem, our relationship to government, which at times, I mean, in Paul's case, may seem the most pagan thing out there, our response to the government is a part of offering our entire lives in response to what God has done for us in Christ. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pastor Omar, before we take our break, then let's let's go into the next major term here. And again, I know there's overlap, but you said the word submission under authority or under order. That's that's mm -hmm. key. The next key term is authority. That that word gets used several times in this passage. Help us into that term before we take our break. Yeah. So we have this term authority here, and this this particular term is used by Paul, and it's used all over the New Testament, and we we can talk about this before or after the break. But the Greek term here is excusia, and it is literally authority. And what authority is, as at least how I have always understood authority and how I teach authority, is that authority is power that has been delegated. So when, when somebody is exercising authority, they are receiving their power to do the task from somebody else. In this particular case, in, in the Christian context, in the government context, the power that the government has over people for the purpose for which God created and ordained it comes from God. How did God get that power? Well, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I think we can make the argument that this goes all the way back to Genesis 1, as so many things do. God spoke the word, and creation came into existence. He created his people. He ordered their lives by uh, means of the moral law. 
And and thus, even before the fall into sin, God ordered the world, and part of that intention was to uh, obey authority. God is the only one who has authority in and of himself. And and as you Correct. as you said, that is seen quite clearly in his role as creator. That's where Paul started his letter to the Romans after he, he laid out his greetings and gave his thesis statement back in chapter 1, 16 and 17. In verse 18, as he started to lay out the unrighteousness of all mankind, the way that he, he did that was he compared them to what God had established in creation, in, in what they should have seen about him in the fact that he's the creator. And so only God has authority in and of himself, and all other authority is ordered, to use that word again, ordered under him. And that's the order, starting with God, in which Christians live in view of his mercies. And we will pick that conversation up on the other side. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFO. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be right back. Please stick around. This week on Issues Etc., we're going to discuss the doctrine of justification with Pastor Hans Feeney, scientism with Dr. Angus Manoj, making the case for life with Scott Klusendorf, Islam with Hank Hanegraaff, and godliness with Pastor Will Whedon. Issues Etc., live weekday afternoons from 3 to 5 on KFUO. The Army National Guard plays a vital role in your community. We're on the front lines supporting essential personnel, first responders, law enforcement, and medical professionals, delivering food, supplies, and medicine, keeping communities safe, making a difference. During emergencies, we're always ready, always there. Learn more about part-time service in the Army National Guard at nationalguard.com. Sponsored by the Missouri Army National Guard. Aired by the Missouri Broadcasters Association at this station. The coronavirus has come with controversy and quarrels. Few agree on what should or should not have been done. Dr. Matthew Harrison compares this confusing babble to the Bible's Tower of Babel, and he tells how Jesus brings the word of peace to those who have grown weary of words. This week on The Lutheran Hour. Sundays at 1230 and 5 p.m. on Worldwide KFUO. Welcome back to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're looking at Romans 13, verses 1 through 7 with Pastor Matt Ulmer of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Bishop, Texas. Pastor Ulmer is the Bishop of Bishop. That's going to catch on now, <laughs> Pastor Ulmer. The it's Bishop gonna, of Bishop. Catch on. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. We're going to send you some business cards sometime. The Bishop of Bishop is with, with us to talk about... <laughs> to talk about governing authorities here in Romans chapter 13. And so, Pastor Ulmer, I mean, we, we could probably spend the whole time just on verse 1, but we need to keep moving, because some of the questions that we've already been bringing up have, I mean, they get talked about here. So verse 2 yeah. starts to put some of these things together when in terms of what does it mean to be under the order of this authority that is ultimately established by God because he's the creator. Paul draws yeah. a conclusion in verse 2 that, may make us a bit uncomfortable, particularly as Americans who celebrate holidays like July 4th. Yeah, Independence Day, right? Yeah, Independence Day. And and for, for us Texans, March 2nd is Texas Independence Day. So Paul says in verse 2, Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. This sounds like yep. rebellion is off limits. What's going on here, Pastor Elmer? Yeah, so... I, I, for for me and my own personal understanding of God's order, I think we have to understand we have to understand that God created human beings before the fall into sin to operate within the Ten Commandments, and one of those commandments I know for every mom and dad out there uh, that they'd love to use is the fourth: honor your father and your mother. 
before the fall into sin, God set authority over human beings for their good, for a purpose. And that purpose is to uh, protect them, uh, to protect the innocent from evil, right? So in honor your father and mother, you have, we should fear and love God so that we do not anger or despise our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. Their their job of authority is to protect us from evil of other people. So when we're we're when the government's working as it should and we are subordinate to the government, uh, they have the authority and the ability and power from God to tamp down evil. As uh, I mean, back in the seminary, we would talk about that this is the the first use of the law to to restrain evil, mm-hmm. and that. When all of this is working, uh, evildoers are punished, good people are uh, commended, uh, the innocent are protected, and everything goes hunky-dory, right? The, the second that the Christian then decides that they are a law unto themselves, or autonomous, or independent, this whole kind of hierarchy, this ordering by God gets thrown out of balance. And, and thus, when, when a person does that, they transcend the law. They break the fourth commandment, they break the first commandment, and they bring harm upon themselves, their family, and their community. So, and, and I, I didn't mean to throw the hard stuff at you right at the beginning, but I, I mean, in terms of things like rebellion, and, and we celebrate, yeah. and it's beyond it's beyond the scope of our time today, to address the American Revolution or something like that. That's simply beyond the, the scope of time. Absolutely. But I, I think, what is, I mean, so this matter of, of resisting the authorities, at, in doing so, you're resisting what God has appointed. Mm-hmm. That's easy enough to understand when, when, as you've been saying, the authority is doing what God intends, which Paul does lay out. That what does God intend for authority? Well, it is to commend what is good, and it is to punish what is evil. And so, not resisting authorities when they're doing that—that that, that's not terribly difficult, certainly for the Christian to understand. Yeah, it, it should and be very prob- easy, right? Right, right, and probably it's not very difficult for a non-Christian to understand either, because that's when, well, the order looks like order. Yep. But when the government steps out of that order, as you've said, and begins to work evil when authority is abused. And we've seen that in the news very vividly this past week. We've seen the abuse of government authority in a very horrifying way. That's that's when Paul's words here about don't resist authority I think start to become the cross that we bear. And this is where, again, I want to put this in the context of 1221, that when we see even even the authority being abused, that what is the Christian response? It is to overcome that evil, not with evil in return, but with good. Now, now, but now, now again, and I will say when, when authority, and this is where things get, I don't know, muddled is not the right word, but where, where it's important to be clear that when, when one authority mishandles that authority and abuses it, then hopefully there is a higher authority that comes in and punishes that evil. And, and of course, if that doesn't happen in this life, it will, as you said, happen according to God. In the next, and so, yeah. I mean, so I'm not suggesting that, that when when there is, you know, the evil that we've seen in terms of abuse of authority this week, that 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 should go unpunished in this life, because the rest of this passage is going to cover that. But in terms of, I would even even, go ahead. I would even strengthen that. I mean, I would even strengthen that personally because that that's the whole point. At least in my opinion, that's the whole point in the beauty of the system is we we live in a country and in a system where authority does have authority. And in, in that particular case, it, in specifically what the country is going through now, it is imperative that the higher authorities do hold the lower authorities into account, because that's the entire reason why God gave them the higher authority. Now, it goes all the way up the chain from, from local to, to federal, and 
there there is of course going to be a temporal kind of highest authority in in our governing system and even that can overstep its bounds but in the, in the specific case that you're talking about uh the the recent murder in Minneapolis i mean it it's clear to to me that um uh, the lower authorities need to be held account by the the higher because that's the system that exists. Now the difficulty for the Christian is to to overcome evil with good and support the the higher authority as far as they do their job and and, and try to maintain the order because it's placed there by God for our good. And right. that, it's one well, of those things that saying it out loud it 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 doesn't taste very good right now but that's kind of the, the the hope that we have as as Christians that we understand how the system is supposed to work even when right now it seems to be massively broken well and and i think without getting into to too many specifics but one of the complications in our own country and others are more qualified to speak on this than me but one of the complications in our own country is that the authority of government doesn't rest with one person or one entity, but is in fact spread out in some respects among citizens. And and part of that is that I, as an individual citizen, do have a voice. And so how how do I use that voice? Well, that's where I balance my responsibility as a member of that body that has authority in terms of a vote that I might cast, but also yeah. with my response as a Christian. And as a Christian, Romans 12, 21 continues to govern what I do and say, that in response to evil, my response is good. And, and yesterday's guest, Pastor Cook, Pastor Tim Cook, a classmate of ours, put, it, put that word good in context of the ultimate good, which is forgiveness. Yeah. Forgiveness extended by Christ, forgiveness extended then through, from Christ to us and from us to others. And, and that greatest good always must come through, even, even as the governing authority is continued to be held accountable, ultimately by God, to do what it is yep. supposed to do, to uphold the good, and to, and to punish evil. Where is my place in that as a Christian? As a Christian, it is to pray. It is to do good in response. As we said, where it gets a bit tricky for us in this, in this country particularly is that each citizen does have a voice and in yep. some sense bears responsibility of this authority. And that, that gets above what I know necessarily in terms of how, how that's structured. But that's where, where some of the difficulty for us as Christians in the United States of America comes into play. Yeah, I, I think the, the other responsibility of an American Christian in particular who participates in the system is to do kind of a hallmark of – of uh, the Lutheran Reformation, and that's we we use our words to call evil evil. Mm. Right, I, right, yeah. And, and again, I mean, this is so without oh, Pastor Pastor Elmer, we could we could spend the whole time <laughs> going off on on tangents. It would be very easy to do so. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, and and so I mean, the the key here is is again, let's keep in mind what we've been saying all along that we're talking about an order here, that order is set by God. And Christians are to place themselves into that order because that's where God has placed them. And they are to do it willingly for love for the neighbor. And, yeah. and I mean, in, in many respects, this, this text does speak in those ideals as if the government is going to do what it should in all times. And, you know, I mean, so let's, let's, maybe take a step back from our own context, and let's think about Paul's context for a moment. Yep. At, at this time in history, when you think about Paul's interaction with the Roman government, it's been a bit mixed, I would say, at this point. He hasn't yet gone on trial, not, not fully. But he's, he's certainly experienced both the misuse of Roman authority, where he was, it, particularly it's in Acts chapter 16, where he's in Philippi, he gets thrown in jail without anybody really putting him on any sort of trial or giving him any what we would call justice. Yep. Later, though, that Roman authority comes in handy for him and does its job when he says, hey, we're Roman citizens. What's going on here? 
So, I mean, mm-hmm. Paul's experience has been has been mixed in this, too. Still, he writes these words. And, and I think that's that's always important to keep in mind. It, it is important to understand, that, and I think it's instructive of our relationship with the governing authorities, too, because because this whole system has been tainted by sin, in, including authority, um, that whether that authority is the government or whether it's a mom and dad at home, um, it has been stained by sin, and it's always going to be a, a mixed bag. Um, I, I think that we can we can talk about ideals and, and we should strive for the ideal and the good, but it's always going to be a mixed bag. Hmm. Right, right. And so again, as as we have opportunity here, what does what does that look like in this country? Well, I mean, the the freedom that we have to speak as a citizen, and especially the the voice that God has given us to speak for the good of our neighbor is always important. So that where we yes. have opportunity to speak out for the good of our neighbor, we do. And and to speak for what is good and, and what is the proper order. And and where we see a governing authority step out of the proper order, to speak about it is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. To, but also well, to recognize... To speak about it and also to use whatever whatever legal remedies are with inside the scope of the law. I mean Well, and that's that's the order coming into play again. Yeah. The the order, the authority that is there because God has established it. And all the while recognizing then that as as I as I speak out, as I say concerning what what is in unjust, that authority may be misused against me. And, yep. and what is my response? Well, that's where I want to keep coming back to 1221. We're not going to overcome evil with more evil. Evil is only yep. overcome with good. Yeah, and, that, and, and that's so, so relevant because as, as I've been a pastor and as I've taught confirmation classes, both um, children and adults, one, one thing always comes comes up and I find it very very fascinating with with respect to the 10 commandments and res, with respect to the law whenever human beings try to fix an evil done for them done to them by doing more evil the sin just multiplies and compounds it actually never makes things better and even though it feels good even though we want to I'm going to use a word here that uh, St. Paul's going to use here in a second that we've already talked about. Even though we might want to take uh, vengeance for ourselves, we might want to avenge ourselves. In doing so, we end up spreading and breeding more evil. Mm. And it's basically universal. That's right. That's right. God, God has placed the vengeance for evil in the authority given to the government and and when the government fails to exercise that authority properly ultimately he will be the one to exercise that that vengeance on the last day so pastor Ulmer, we this is it's been a fascinating conversation <laughs> but i, I want to make sure that we do touch on other parts of the text so and i think where we've been you know we've we've been talking verse 3 rulers are not a terror to good conduct but to bad again this is this is the the role of the government is not to be a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do what is good, Paul says, and you'll receive his approval, for he's God's servant for your good. If you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Again, Paul, as we said, is talking to the Christian, placing himself under this order that God has established. But there are words here concerning what the role of the governing authority is. How does Paul lay that out for us, Pastor Ulmer? I mean, I think here in verse 4, St. Saint, Saint Paul is very clear as to what the role of the government is, and it is to bear the sword against evil. Like I, I mentioned earlier in our understanding of what the first use of the law is, the, the curb is, is to restrain evil. So for the protection of the innocent, God has given the sword to government to make sure that human beings uh, do not do evil against other human beings. That is their purpose. If if you have the intention of doing evil against another human being, I think St. Paul is making the argument, you ought to be afraid. And, and that is a good thing. If you don't have the intention of doing evil and harm against another human being, 
um, the, the government should not uh, be a threat to you, but should also should be a source of commendation. Mm, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And of course, I mean, again, verse three. This this was on my mind earlier. We've we've talked about it, but you know, where it says rulers are not a terror to good conduct or to bad. That's the way it should be. Sometimes rulers are a terror to good conduct. And and yeah. that's that's not good. What what is the Christian response when? And this is where just to put it in in individual Christian terms, when I am that Christian who has done who has suffered for doing what is right for for being a Christian, as as Peter puts it in his first epistle, what what is my response? Again, I'm going to go back to verse 21 of the previous chapter. You're not going to overcome that evil by doing more evil in return. It will be overcome with good, which which Paul is laying out here. So let, let's keep going, Pastor Olmar, because I want to make sure we cover each each part of the text, at least in, in brief. Well, Paul's laid out what the government is to do. It is to approve what is good. And I think, you know, certainly Paul Paul references that elsewhere. First Timothy chapter two comes to mind where he he commands prayer for governing authorities for the purpose of people leading a quiet and godly life which enables the spread of the gospel to all men, because God desires all to be saved. So there's the approval of what is good. That's the, the benefit of this governing authority. The governing authority is there to punish evil on the other hand. And then Paul makes the conclusion in verse 5 as to why a Christian should submit himself, should place himself under this order. What are the reasons Paul gives for the Christian putting himself under this order? Yeah, the the first one is, I think, kind of what you alluded to at the beginning of this conversation, which is kind of the strange one, which is a Christian ought to submit themselves to the government because they fear the punishment of God via the government. So we, the the example, the really silly example that I give to my confirmation students is this: if if you're driving in the car and the speed limit says 75, and you're you're driving underneath the speed limit, you shouldn't fear. If you're going over that, should you fear the authorities? Yes, because you're breaking the law. So one reason why we submit is because we we fear the consequence for our action. The second, which is more positive, is understanding that because of who we have been made in Christ, that we understand God's will, that he has placed the order for our good, and, and we place ourselves under that authority because we know it's what God wants for us. So you have kind of a negative reason for putting yourself under authority, and you have a positive reason for doing it. And I think both are very, very strong uh, reasons. For sure. And I, I think you know the way Paul Paul words it there in verse 5, the first one, not only to avoid God's wrath, that's the primary topic he's been bringing up in chapter 13, but this matter of the conscience really does take us back to the beginning of the whole section in chapter 12, that my conscience is is freed through the mercies of God, freed for this yep. precise life. And so it does it does bring a matter, and this is maybe a bit odd, but it brings a matter of joy in the Christian life even underneath governing authorities. And typically, joy is not what we think of when we place ourselves under some kind of authority, but there is that joy because of the mercies of God. You know, I'm not particularly joyful, perhaps, when I, when I have to follow the speed limit. Or, as yeah. Paul takes us, I'm not particularly joyful when I have to pay my taxes, and yet, yeah. and yet that's where Paul takes us. So, Pastor Rumble, we've got about five minutes left here on the morning to, to cover yeah. taxes, this last verse, which really is going to set the stage for where he's going in the next text. Yeah, and and I think just, just to comment on that, we, we might find it odd to speak about joy in these terms, but, but when we understand what's going on, the joy comes from the, the outcome, because when we are living our lives in tune with the expressed will of God— there is or ought to be less evil in the world. So we get to live our lives as they were intended. Yeah, yeah. Take us, take us into this matter of, of paying taxes, because this is, you know, uh, yeah. how, how is that so joyful? This, this, why, why is this a part of my Christian life? <laughs> this, is, this is where every, everybody, everybody who is listening to this uh, program is going to just turn it off and say, I never want to hear from that Pastor Omer and Pastor Apple guy again. Uh, part of this joy, part of this obligation that we have to uh, 
authority, because it has been given to them by God, is that they have the authority to levy and collect taxes. And as they are God's servant for our good, um, where they are doing, uh, where they are taxing in a manner that is not against the express will of God, they have the authority to do it, and we ought to uh, write our checks. Um, that is how I understand this, and this is how I have lived and acted, even though I don't like it very much. No, I, and typically it's not something we like, but but I think Paul helps us here to, and not, not to make it something that we uh, like is not the the right word, but something that we do understand is not outside yeah. of the life that God has given according to His mercy. And I really yeah. think that's where where Paul then sets the stage here with this conversation concerning taxes and broadens the scope to this matter of well, what does it mean to be under an order? It's it's bigger than under an order of whatever the governing authority is, but really it's it's under the order of this is where we're going to take us in the next text, under the order of love, that because of what God has done, I place myself under this order to love all people. Pastor Omar, with just a couple minutes here, give us a quick summary, wrap things up, give us good news from this text. <laughs> well, uh, the, good, the good news here is that um, we are bought and won by the the death and resurrection of our Lord, we have the wonderful opportunity to be called the children of God by God, and thus we are. And we have the opportunity, the wonderful, blessed opportunity to love our neighbors by fulfilling the command of the fourth commandment, to, to live under authority, to do what we ought to pay what we owe to every neighbor uh, so that our our lives together might be peaceful, they might be joyous, they might be fulfilling, and that the gospel of Jesus Christ might be spread to the ends of the earth. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, what what St. Paul is telling us here is is in line with God's law, it's in line with God's will, and everything that God, uh, does, creates, and ordains is good and for our benefit. So, I mean, with with all of the uh, exceptions withstanding, uh, we, we understand that authority is something that God has placed into our life for our good, and, and because of his mercy, we, we do have joy. Pastor Matt Ulmer is the pastor at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Bishop, Texas, the Bishop of Bishop, helping us this morning with Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Pastor Ulmer, thanks for your time today. It's a great conversation. You're welcome. You have a great day. God has placed an order in this world. He is the creator of all things. It is his order. It is his authority. And for the good of his creation, he exercises that authority through people. What is the Christian's place in? Under that order, it is one in which evil is not overcome with more evil, but evil is overcome with good. And that includes things like paying taxes. Does it seem distasteful? Perhaps. But this is a part of God's order for our good so that the spread of his gospel would continue through the lips of us, his people. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithfield, Texas. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again next week.